There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Welcome, everybody, to what I'm going to call a special episode of the Your Mountain podcast. They're all special, but this but one's this extra one's special. Sp- is it specialer? Specialer. More, more special? Or more special. More spe- specialer sounds better. More specialer. Yeah. But it is. It's a, I mean, we've been doing this. We started, I was thinking about this. We started this kind of journey of ours. Um, I mean, really, you got to go back almost a year. Uh, I mean, you know, forget the fact that we put our first episode out last June, but we really started the three of us having these conversations about, you know, let's do this about a year ago. Yeah. Right. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of conversations leading to, how's the internet work? Yeah. Leading to (laughs) ideas of, well, how do we record these? Who hosts these podcasts? Do you use a tape recorder? Yeah, do do we need a website? Yeah, do we do we use a tape recorder or an eight track? I mean, we yeah. just we didn't know. And you had both, and I had both. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was you know, kind of formulating. How are we going to do this? What's what's our logo going to look like someday? Speaking of that, someday I'm going to put out there every iteration of that logo that we went through before we came up with the logo we were Nobody using has that much time or interest. <laughs> Nobody cares. Yeah. But it, I think it's fascinating. It's like watching the very first it's like watching the very first Mickey Mouse animation, you know, yeah, yeah. Com- compared to what yeah. it is today. Yeah. Uh, cuz we're like Walt Disney. But, you know, it, it all kind of this this whole thing all started with an idea, you know, and, and this whole idea about, you know, wanting to have this conversation about, you know, Genuine issues affecting land, water, and wildlife, and present them in a really, a truly pragmatic, nonpartisan way, just to get information out there. We wanted to force everyone else to listen to the arguments that we were having in with each other. Right, and yeah, we we've had a lot. Yeah, we, we've yeah. had a lot. Yeah, we just managed to get other people to make the arguments for us. That's yeah. right, and, then the, we, you know, and we force other to, people to listen. Yeah, yeah, but you're not being forced. Just so we're clear right now. You're doing this because you love it, and you should go back and listen to every one of them again. And, and so we started this, and we and we finally we finally said, "Yep, let's do this. We're going to do this." And we recorded our first. We flew out to Seattle. Yep. And we recorded our first episode, and we launched. Uh, our podcast, this Your Mountain podcast, last June. And we're now, uh, this will be our 32nd episode of the Your Mountain podcast. All right. uh, we, I mean, it, it's been a heck of a ride. Uh, and it, it's, it's, I mean, it's special because we all got, we've, we've built it together, but we've got, we're still building it. And we're looking for opportunities to build this bigger uh, and really get this message out there. And that, I think, is what makes this podcast podcast episode so special. I agree. I think we, we started at the beginning, you know, our goal on this, we've told some people is, you know, for whatever reason, people make podcasts and it was different than most. You know, we didn't set out being like, hey, let's figure out how this is going to be our next, you know, our, our new economic adventure or whatever. We, what we thought was, we all very strongly believe in the future of hunting and fishing and the great outdoors and the opportunity and that the way that continues, the only way that continues is by understanding it and sharing it and having a unified community that gets it. And so we're like, well, we, you know, we think that we have something to add to that conversation. How do we share it with people? And so, so here we are. So here we are. And I, I don't know, do we... I, I don't know what we do here. Do we do like a gigantic drum roll or do we just uh, just jump right in? I mean, really jump right in, jump right in. after the drum roll, after Let's the drum roll. OK, so I'm, ju- I'm drum roll and I'm kidding. drum rolling the heck out of this table. Yeah, no, it, it, here's the deal. We 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 want to grow this. We want to grow this podcast. We want to grow our, our audience. We want to get this message out there. And so we're incredibly thrilled. We, we are just we're just super excited. Uh, on this podcast to be able to announce that we have uh, now five strategic partners. That's right. 
And so a strategic partner for us was when we looked at this, we said, what do we, what would we like to do? We'd like to find some people that likewise feel that the future of the great outdoors is extremely important and sharing is important. So we reached out to some um, great folks who had you know, the similar interests and cared about the same things that we did and said, will you partner with us to share this, you know, to, to, to bring people in and share this podcast? And they said, absolutely. And so um, without further ado. Yeah. So here we go. So from here, starting now, going forward, the strategic partners that, that your mountain is partnering up with, Federal Premium Ammunition, Viking Tactics, Vortex Optics, Gunworks, and the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. And so what we've done with this podcast, what we want to do is we want to, we want to announce to everybody these partnerships. And we want to introduce everybody that listens to this show, to, to this podcast, to these strategic partners that you probably already know, yeah. uh, that you probably already know, and you're probably very familiar with their products. Uh, but so the rest of this podcast, we, we took some time uh, and we recorded uh, a series, just short interviews with representatives from each of these companies to learn about their company, to learn about what the, their hunting heritage means to them personally, but to them as a company, and to talk to them about you know, what they see as some of the challenges facing our community, our, our hunting and fishing and outdoor recreation community. What are some of those challenges and what are some potential solutions to those challenges? And so everybody knows after this, these strategic partnerships, it's not going to change our focus at all. What we're going to continue to do is we're going to continue to talk with you about issues. We're going to continue to talk about policy. We're going to continue to try and give you the full gamut, and both, you know, all sides of these arguments so you can understand them better and understand the, you know, the, 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 the nuance. That's right. So, really, really, these partnerships are just, it's an opportunity to help deliver that message to a broader audience. Yep. Right. I mean, and that's really, that's really what matters. I mean, you know, it's delivering, delivering the message to a broader audience. So without further ado. And, and absolutely. Mike, you have anything else you want to you want to add before we get into some of these interviews? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Always a man of many words. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. Anyway, so the way the way this podcast is going to work is we we pre-recorded interviews with an, with like I said with representatives from each of these companies. I will say that the so on this particular episode the the, the company's represented are Federal Premium Ammunition, Viking Tactics, Vortex Optics, and Gunworks. We will have a future. Uh, podcast uh, where we hope to be able to sit down with somebody from the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership and speak uh, speak with them uh, about you know the, 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 some important issues important issues great things you got it important issues and great things uh, and so you know that's that's how this podcast is going to go so it might come across as a little bit choppy as we bounce between interviews uh, and their phone I think, interviews so. and their phone interviews too but I think you're gonna I think you'll enjoy this introduction uh we certainly do we're looking forward to a long uh um, productive partnership with these companies and look forward to bringing you continuing to bring you great content so enjoy the rest of the your mountain podcast hey joining us right now we have ryan bronson ryan how are you doing i am doing really well thanks for having me on guys Hey, you, you're uh, becoming a regular now, I think. Well, that's just good for your mountain because, you know, I, I bring the goods. Yeah, well, you, you do. You, you haven't failed to disappoint yet on the one time you've been on our show. I'm not sure. I don't think that's how you're supposed to say that. <laughs> Is that not no, the right dude, way to put it? No. It's always such a builder. You haven't failed to disappoint. Should I have said you? Uh, Maybe we should work you, on your vocabulary. You haven't disappointed us yet. <laughs> Ryan, I, hope that I, I hope that I sometime have the opportunity to d disappoint all of you. <laughs> uh, anyway, Ryan, yeah, I do appreciate you being here. We all do. Um, and so why don't you tell us, I mean, you've been on before, but uh, tell us a little bit about um, what you do and, uh, and your company, and what your company does. Well, I'm the director of conservation for Vista Outdoor, and most people don't know what Vista Outdoor is. We're a uh, 
a company that owns a whole bunch of brands that everybody knows what they do, but primarily for the purposes of, of your mountain, uh, I handle the conservation government relations, uh, and outreach for federal premium ammunition in, in our associated products. So, uh, I am second generation at the company. My dad actually worked in the factory building shotgun shells and shotgun shell primers for 40 years and, and retired. And, uh, when I got the opportunity to join the company and become the third ever conservation program manager for, for federal, I was, I was happy to do it. Now I get the opportunity to work with all of our brands, which includes Camelback and, and, uh, Savage Arms and, and, and a wide array of different outdoor products. But the flagship brand for us as a company is federal ammunition, which is a, you know, the full array ammunition manufacturer. In fact, we're the largest ammunition manufacturer in the country. Uh, center fire rifle, uh, rim fire and shot show. We make it all, um, in Anoka, Minnesota is where our factory is. So shoot it all up, it. we'll shoot them you're, up. You're, you're, up there. <laughs> you're up there in Minnesota too, right? Yeah. So Anoka, Minnesota is where our factory is. I live in, uh, uh a suburb south of St. Paul. So I, I, I'm, I'm Minnesota born and raised, but for six months where I uh, tried to make my living uh, in the state of Colorado, but that failed miserably. So I came back to the Midwest where people understand my accent and don't mock and ridicule it. You know, um, yeah, yeah. Don't you know? Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't ridicule it. Uh, so I'm, I'm married to somebody from people the think we sound Midwest. funny too, at least Dave. No, no, no. we don't sound funny. Uh, but hey, I mean, so you're, you're back in Minnesota, uh, and I'm guessing, well, I'm not even guessing. I know you do your fair amount. Of I do. Uh, I grew up, uh, you know, I, people ask, you know, do you remember the first time you shot a gun? I don't cause I have always shot guns, you know, especially having a dad that worked in the factory, you know, ammunition was free. Well, to me it was, it was cheap to him, but a, f a lot of factory seconds over, over the years. Um, but yeah, I, I, we own a farm in uh, West Central Minnesota, where that's where I do all of my deer hunting and turkey hunting in Minnesota. Uh, great whitetails, uh, okay duck hunting, but I I get the opportunity to hunt really all over the country now uh, with the job, and and uh, I am working on trying to take a game animal or a fish species in all fifty states, and I'm about thirty states in right now. Well, that, that, well, that's a pretty solid start, and that probably means that you have a lot of experiences to draw from here when I ask you uh, what your favorite hunting or fishing experience or memory is. It, you know, if you've been traveling all over the country, but you also have your home roots there in Minnesota. You know, it's hard to just pick one, but above the rest. I, was, I was just thinking about it uh, today um, because my very first deer hunt in minnesota when i was a kid you had to be 12 to hunt deer in the year that i turned 12 my dad had drawn an elk tag in wyoming and he and it overlapped with our deer season so he was in wyoming hunting elk and my mom who had never shot a deer or gutted a deer took me out in the woods now i I'd done all the prep with my dad. Uh, you know, we'd been shooting for a long time. I'd been, you know, my 243 was dialed in. I helped build the tree stand out in the woods that I was going to hunt out of. Opening day comes. My mom and I go out in the woods, and about 35 minutes into the my first morning as a deer hunter, a little buck fawn came trotting out, and I had an antlerless tag, and I shot it, and one shot dropped it it was you know not very far away but then my mom and i spent half an hour in the stand watching it because that's what they say you're supposed to wait a half an hour then we got down and it honest to god took us two hours to gut that deer out before we even started dragging it and this deer didn't even weigh 100 pounds um took forever it was more of a biology uh, necropsy <laughs> where we were investigating all of the body parts in there. Uh, but it, it was, I know it's unusual. It was, it was not the prototypical uh, first hunt, but it was a great experience. And, and uh, about 
15, 20 years later, I helped my mom get her first deer. So uh, we were able to bring it all full circle. But my mom was the one that took me on my first deer hunt. And so that, that memory sticks out a lot. That's, that's awesome. I think that's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's awesome that you took her too. Um, you know, another question I want to ask you, and this kind of, this, I mean, this is both for you, but also from the mindset of your, uh, your company uh, with Federal Premium. What do you view as the biggest challenge right now facing the hunting, fishing, outdoor recreation? Uh, uh, I think world? for us as a company, our, our biggest concern long term is a decline in the number of participants in, in hunting and the shooting sports. We're not in the fishing side of the business, um, so we focus on that. And I think it, it one of the reasons the company hired me, uh, we've Federal had always had a conservation person that, that managed the Pittman-Robertson side of the business and everything. Uh, but one of the reasons they hired me is because prior to joining Federal, I had run a hunter recruitment and retention program at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. One of the first ones started in the country. I, I started the program back in 2003 and ran it for several years before I, I joined the company. So Federal was already focused on that. And the company had a long history where we had been looking at Federal helped start the 4-H shooting sports program, had been involved with 4-H and other outreach programs for a long time. So even before there was concerns about declines in participation, Federal had really been involved in that whole recruiting the next generation of conservationists and, and shooters and hunters. And so now over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, as we've seen declining participation in hunting and the shooting sports, well, hunting primarily, shooting sports are doing pretty well. Uh, that's been a concern. And I think for us looking as we go forward, a lot of the policy initiatives that we look to try to enact in in state governments and at the federal level, and a lot of the products that we're coming to market with really are aimed at not only meeting the needs of our current customer base, but trying to help create and incentivize bringing new people into the sport. Because without hunters and shooters, the current system of, of wildlife management in the country falls apart. And without quality wildlife management, uh, wildlife species, and, and healthy ecosystems, our company ceases to exist. So it, it's a long-term important thing for us to do that's good for business in the short term, but it's critical for business in the long term. So I think hunter recruitment, retention, and reactivation, the R3 movement is probably one of our biggest focuses. And it, it sounds like you've got... Uh... A plan in place and probably partnerships in place to uh, to try and address some of that. Uh, and certainly, we appreciate the opportunity to partner with you all to try and help get some get the word out on addressing some of these issues as well. All right, Ryan, thanks. It's been fun, man. I'd like to welcome to the program Sergeant Major Kyle Lamb of Viking Tactics. Hey, Kyle, thanks for being with us. Man, it's awesome uh, coming to you live from a river in Tennessee. What are you doing on the river? We got a little cabin on the river, so we uh, it's it's almost snowing here in Tennessee. So we're for some reason that makes us go sit down by the river and enjoy it. So yeah, we got a little cabin by the river, so we're uh, yeah we're loving isn't, it. Man. Isn't it's, almost uh, isn't almost snow and rain? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just... yeah, yeah, liquid sunshine. That's what I like to call it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I didn't think there was much between that. You know, if it's almost <laughs> snowing, that means it's raining. That's right. We're hoping uh. for snow, but it, right now it's rain. Three and a half foot above <laughs> the, the high water mark. So we're, we're a little bit, uh, we're a little bit wet right now. Uh. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we'd take your weather over the wind we get about any day of the week. No, we'd come visit. I think that, uh, uh, you know, if, if we can fight, we should light a big fire. We'll, we'll be there shortly. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of good smallmouth fishing here. We've got a lot of good uh, uh, bow fishing. There's a lot of lot of outdoor sports here in Tennessee. And the good thing about Tennessee is they do have some restrictive gun laws. You you know, the one I don't like is if you can't pull it with a five ton truck, it's illegal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, how big's your truck? <laughs> <laughs> big enough. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Kyle. Uh, so tell tell us a little bit about viking tactics what what do you do what does viking tactics do so we we've kind of evolved over the years we started out 
uh, primarily as a training company. So when I retired from the military, I was traveling a lot and training a lot of military and law enforcement guys, as well as uh, citizens of the U.S. And then that kind of transitioned to designing some some gear, uh, mostly geared toward most of that kit was geared towards law enforcement, military guys, but now we've done a few products that are, are specifically, uh, specifically for hunters. So we've got bow slings, we've got the big rig, which is a, a chest rig for your pistol. If you're out, you know, in bear country. And then of course, all of our slings, which are kind of our bread and butter, those are, are made for not just, you know, your bolt action rifle, but we make a lot of those for ARs and we have a specific set for snipers and hunters and, and things like that as well. So, yeah, I do a lot of consulting with other companies in the industry, so I stay busy with that as well. I, I've also I write for some magazines as well as I've I've uh, written three books so far. Um, one about the carbine, one about the pistol, one about leadership, and and we've got a few more of those we're working on too. So yeah, Viking Tactics. We continue to evolve as we go. We try to take ideas that we have to make it easier for guys to shoot or or to to be in the fight downrange and apply those to our product line. So that's pretty much where all of our products have come from. And then the training continues to evolve too, because we see when guys come back from overseas or, or law enforcement guys give us some of their experiences, we try to come up to, a, you know, figure out a solution to some of the problems that they're having. So yeah, it's, that's what I do. It's uh, when I'm not doing all that, I'm hunting and fishing. So we have a good time. So for folks who might've been living in a cave and hopefully not in some other country, but folks living in a cave, can you kind of run down What's your what's your background in uh, the military? Uh, I I started out in the 82nd as a communications guy, and I was in an infantry outfit. But I was a commo guy, uh, carried a radio around, and then from there I went special forces, tried out to be a Green Beret, did that. I was actually in Arabic language school when Desert Shield, Desert Storm, kicked off. So uh, shortly after I got out of Arabic training, I went over there, spent uh, some time with Fifth Special Forces Group in the desert, uh, trying to, you know, help out the Kuwaitis at that time. And then eventually, uh, I tried out for, uh, a special mission unit. I got selected to go there and I spent all but a, a year of my retaining remaining time in the military. So about 16 years at the unit there. I had one other year that I was at uh, first special forces group, but yeah, I did some stuff in Somalia for the whole black Hawk down deal. I also did, uh, uh, five tours to Iraq for the current war. Um, I never went to Afghanistan. I, I, I still have hopes that I might make it over there, but that's pretty much my background. So working as an assaulter, as a sniper, uh, as a sniper instructor, as a shooting instructor for the military, doing all that. And then, uh, yeah, then I just got, I guess, got tired of the killing. It made me cold inside. So I got out of the military. That's the way but, Dave feels about hunting. He's about done. No. He's gonna. He's about to. He's about to swear off. He's tired of chasing elk. He's like. He told me the other day. Dave was like, "You know what I really want to do?" I said, "What?" He said, "Play video games." Uh, I don't even. Know, I don't even know how to respond to that, Nephi. I have no idea how to respond to that because you're too cold inside. I am. Yeah, I'm cold inside. It's cold but, in this basement. But, That's where it's cold. Uh, but I, I'm guessing, Kyle, that you took you took all of your experiences from a, a long distinguished military career and transferred those into starting this company. That's kind of what it sounds like uh, to me, right? Yeah, that and the fact that I I really love to train people. Ever you know whether I did that with the military or not, I've always liked to instruct and help folks to become better at whatever it might be. And uh, I've been a shooter since I was a kid, you know, growing, I grew up in South Dakota uh, on a little dirt farm up there, a couple hours north of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So close to the Minnesota border and just hunting whatever I could. We, you know, we killed a lot of, of uh, gophers and, and things like that. And probably a lot of birds that maybe I should or shouldn't have shot, but whatever. And, uh, I just, I just love to shoot, love to train. And that's kind of, I, I always kind of knew I would do that. I had told my wife when I was getting close to retirement, she goes, well, what are you going to do when you retire? And I said, I'm going to teach people to shoot. She goes, no, seriously, what are you going to do? <laughs> and I, uh, by the time I got out of the military, I had a year of classes booked. So I, I knew I would be comfortable for at least a year. And, and now we've been really blessed that it's continued to be, uh, Things have, have continued to go really well for us. We we've already booked up all of this coming year, so we're we're uh, we're excited about that. You know, we're traveling around. I'm trying to do a, a little bit less time on the road, so 
I have backed off a little bit on the number of classes, but it's it's still enough. You know, I don't know if Nephi's taken one of your classes, but he I'm, sure acts like he uh, like he has. Yeah, I've never said that I have, but yeah. I'm taking one this year. <laughs> Are you? So, yeah, my yeah, little okay. brother. Like Good. my little brother. Um, I met Kyle through. Um, it's my little brother shot for Team Sig, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and kind of introduced us, and uh, that's kind of. But he's been talking for a long time. He wanted to go to to one of those classes, and so we're trying to make. I'm trying to look, make sure my calendar's open this year because Kyle shot me a note, and so I want to go hit that class. and And I'm not going to say what date. Yeah, it we're is. trying to get these get these guys. Yeah, don't. We're, we're going to try to get these. Everybody uh, will fill my get class. These guys up. into a street. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be a a street fighter with pistol. So it, it's. We normally run that class with carbines, so the AR, and uh, we fight in and around vehicles. So guys that haven't done it before will get a chance to see what happens when you shoot into or out of a vehicle through the windshield, all the other, the glass and the different parts of the vehicle. So they see, you know, what happens there. Because there's a lot of negativity out there. Guys are like, oh, you shouldn't use a vehicle as cover. But as our mutual friend, Chili Palmer says, <laughs> hey, it's thicker than air. So we try to teach guys how to use whatever they can to hide behind, because that's what law enforcement guys and military guys have have out in the field with them it's going to be a vehicle there's not always a concrete wall there so it's that's one of my favorite classes to teach so yeah we're hoping we can get nephi there to embarrass him oh, in front of all i'm ready I'm I, I, i'd appreciate it if you'd record that yes. for I'm a gonna, video dave's gonna dave's gonna come to the same class when you do uh <laughs> when you do it with uh, with bolt action ot six instead of uh instead of carbine or oh, pistol He's i'll be, be there, there. <laughs> yeah i'll be there uh, hey kyle uh so I, I did want to ask you i mean you you'd mentioned earlier on here you said uh you enjoy kind of transitioned into enjoying getting out and doing hunting and fishing and so forth. Uh, just being in the outdoors, you're talking about where you are and, you know, they're in Tennessee right now and kind of on the, on the water and having opportunities. What, what is your favorite hunting or fishing experience or your favorite memory that you've got related to hunting or fishing or the outdoors? Well, I, I would tell you this, it's probably easier for me to tell you what the bad memories <laughs> are because I got really, well, there's, there's few, there's very few of those because if you're hunting and fishing, it's good. And, and I would say probably my favorite hunting experiences have been uh, elk hunting with a bow. And I, and I think and Nephi Cole. not killing an animal. No, he, he said, he <laughs> yeah, said, no, that's Nephi. Yeah, I was say, he said bad experiences might've been a, a shorter list. And I had assumed every experience with Nephi <laughs> fell in that category. So that can be another episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we went hunting with Nephi just because I was told I would get a tax break, but I still haven't received that. For taking him hunting but no i think uh, uh, what i what i tell a lot of guys is you know go go out elk hunting if you haven't done it because when i grew up we didn't you know where i grew up there's no elk um i love every kind of hunting i do but i would say i probably enjoy the elk hunting with my bow more because it's it's so much more difficult and i would say those difficult hunts where i wasn't successful i still had better success of coming home with a, a great experience than some of those hunts where I actually killed a critter and, and brought home all the meat, which, you know, I get in trouble with my wife if I don't bring home bring home the uh, the meat for her to cook up. But Like on this I, last I know, elk I hunt with Nephi? Every time I go out in the woods. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually brought one. I, I actually brought one home. Yeah, there you go, Dave. Oh, you didn't tell me that. N- Nephi left that detail out of the story of the elk hunt. Yeah, Ryan Kleckner and I, we lurped up in there, and I did a sniper count now. We shot him both, both with lead bullets and ar-15 uh, i shot mine with a six millimeter creedmoor and he shot his with a six five creedmoor i fought the range and, data uh, yeah we they didn't even know we were there we snuck up with them and yeah it was it was awesome so yeah man i don't know i can't tell you the best i mean i look back one of the one of the probably the most memorable experiences that i can still remember is my first deer that i shot with my dad and he had went and got a 30 30 from the neighbor for me to borrow because he didn't want me to use his winchester model 94 because he was deer hunting too so um some people aren't big fans of the 3030 but uh it's basically a it's the predecessor of the same ballistics as a 300 blackout so <laughs> it's the guys that all love that i mean it's the it's the same thing so i shot a doe with uh with a lever gun for my first my first deer hunt i had seen a lot of deer get killed and i'd gutted a lot of deer and skinned a lot of deer for my dad but i'd never i'd never killed one so that was my first uh I still remember that kind of like it happened yesterday. You know, we were, I, I w- I'd like to say we were road hunting, but we were, really weren't because there's not a lot of roads where we're at, but we were driving kind of down a cow path and, and we got into some deer and we come blazing out of his old Chevy truck. And uh, I actually hit the deer as it ran by, by us. He killed one too. And it was, it was just awesome. And that, 
kind of got me hooked. I, I love deer. Well, like I said, I love hunting. So whatever it is. I mean, you're preaching to the choir right here. You know, if, you know, picking a story is hard when, when they're all great. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, hey, what do you yeah. think, you know, speaking of the hunting and fishing world, what do you, what do you think the biggest challenge is today facing the hunting and fishing, you know, outdoor world generally? Well, so if, it, if it's the fishing and hunting and outdoor world, our world that we live in, then I would say probably the biggest challenge is some of the infighting, the hyphenated hunter guy that says, you know, you got to shoot it back country with the recurve, tradi- you know, traditional bow, and you had to be standing on one foot. I mean, there's all these, these things like people want to hyphenate it to where they're special and you're not. And I think that that infighting, it's got to be, hey, I'm going hunt and I'm going to support you any possible way I can to hunt versus, you know, I, I just don't like a lot of the fighting that kind of goes on in our world. I think that we, we all should support each other. You know, you go down to North Carolina and I've been on a, a deer hunt where they ran dogs and ran the deer and the deer come running by. And I'm like, what in the world's going on? And I, I'm going to tell you that probably isn't my favorite kind of hunting, but for guys that grew up doing that and it's, it's how they were raised. I, I have no problem with it because it's legal and, you know, you know, let them do it. So don't, uh, don't look down your nose at, at those folks. Um, I would also say that if we're trying to get more people, you know, the problem out there is we, we do see a lot of these kids that they want to sit at home and play video games or, or update their social media feed to make sure that they're good to go there. I think that hunters are a dying breed. So if, if we're going to maintain what we have and continue to grow that, we, we as hunters have got to do a better job of taking other people hunting. And, it, and it's not always taking a woman or a kid. Sometimes you're taking a 40 year old man that's never hunted before. That's a law enforcement officer or a military guy or a civilian that's just never done it. And they look at you and go, how do I do this? We'll take them out there and, and, and give them that chance because maybe they'll go, wow, this is awesome. I want to take my kids hunting and my wife and, you know, grandpa and grandma and whatever, you know, that's one thing that's nice about the shooting sports, the uh, hunting and fishing is you can do it with everybody. It's, it's not, you don't get rejected because you can't run or you can't, you know, hit somebody harder or whatever it, you can take, you know, you two things that, that with you, you shared with me that I really appreciate. Number one, I love that term hyphenated hunting and the talk about, Hey, let's get away from it. Um, you know, I think you, you're the first one, you know, we were talking about that and I, and I, I love that explanation of just saying, look, let's, uh, let's, we're all in the same boat. Let's not label each other. Let's just be, let's, let's be part of this together. And, and I think that that goes further than just hunting. And the second thing I have to take, thank you for introducing me to was Chili Palmer, because that was a super fun uh, bow hunt that we went on. And man, it was, yeah, it was, it was just <laughs> yeah. a blast. And yeah. so uh, that was a good time. Yeah. And hey, I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think if I can, add, if I can add, can I add run, one more thing real quick? Um, one of the other things that is a little disheartening too, is um, the whole public lands deal. You know, now it's become like if you don't shoot your animal on public land, you're a bad person. And there's all these T-shirts, you know, public land hunter. And it's like, you know, there's nothing wrong with going out on private property and hunting as well. It's just I'm all good with you guys going in the wilderness. And I do that, too. And going in the national forest, we want to do that. But stop looking down your nose at the guy that owns a ranch or like us here in Tennessee, we own several hundred acres. We got great whitetails and and turkey there, a lot of squirrels. Why would I not hunt on my own land if I have it? So yeah, stop being, you know, stop looking down your nose at people and let's just get, you know, I got two points to follow up on that. And you know, one of them, 70% of the land in this country is private and you get into States, you know, places like Kansas that uh, something like 95% private, you know, the, the idea of being able to hunt public land in a lot of places is a foreign concept outside of the West anyway. Uh, and then the other piece is, I think there are, there are a couple kinds of hunting. There's, there's front country, back country hunting. I love to do back country hunting. I love that there are people that love to hunt in the front country. And I love that people love to road hunt. And I don't judge at all because it means they're not in the back country with me. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I'm hoping that they're going to have some success. I mean, it's, and you it's know what? there, yeah. everybody, yeah everybody's opportunity is different. Everybody's expectations of their experience are different and everybody's has different limitations as well. When I take my eight year old when he's nine, when he's 10, whenever, when, you know, that's where we're going to go first, you know, and we're going to keep going there on the weekend and when we have the spare time. And so, and I, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's one of these things where let's look at the whole universe of opportunities and, and, 
and and let's enjoy every one of them. So I, this is kind of our big. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't even say. Maybe I shouldn't even say this. But I even hunt Africa <laughs> because that's an awesome experience. And in the things that that conservation has done to save critters over there, it's unbelievable. So yeah, hunt the entire world as much as you possibly can. I mean, it's uh, if you're in the military, hey, good luck. Go get your your terrorist grand slam. You know, <laughs> shoot a Tunisian in yeah. in Africa and get a you know get a special well, badge. Kyle, I don't care. Always a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you, man. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I definitely appreciate it, and and appreciate the opportunity to uh, to partner up with you and getting the word out on some of these issues facing land, water, and wildlife, and uh, uh, some you know these issues that hunters and anglers have to deal with that maybe don't get the uh, the type of coverage that we'd like to see them get. And we will talk to you again shortly. This is Nephi Cole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mark, thank you for being on the phone with us. We sincerely appreciate it. No, here awesome, in Minnesota, yeah. and no, it's great. And so we've uh, we've uh, been enjoying our time here this evening, hanging out uh, in uh, Dave's extremely cold basement while he types on his phone. Uh, Mike's. Let's be clear, we're in Mike's basement. Mike's not Dave's. extremely cold basement. I thought you lived here too. I feel like I do sometimes. This is the only place I ever see you. We're here a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, did, well, Mark, did his, thank you. Did his mom make you guys something nice for dinner then? Yeah, she did. Meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ms. McGrady. Will, Will, Will Farrell loves it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, thanks you for coming on the show. We sincerely appreciate it. And this is kind of an exciting podcast for us. We're introducing the people to folks that are partnering with us to be able to share um, some more information about you know the great outdoors and things that we think are important opportunities to hunt, fish, to to outdoor recreate, and you know these lands and and be that you know private lands that we all enjoy recreation on or public lands. So, kind of these these larger issues. And, and so we appreciate you coming on to talk with us about some of those things. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for having me on. I mean, you know, that those are things that, you know, I guess, and we'll jump into some of the stuff in, in a couple minutes, but that we as a company and a lot of us personally uh, care about quite a bit and they're kind of at our core. So um, yeah, it's always, it's always good to chat about those things and, and uh, explore, uh, explore those topics and hopefully uh, inform uh, people that, uh, about what's going on. So for people that, that don't know, and I can't imagine who doesn't, uh, hasn't seen Vortex, could you tell us a little bit, you know, give us a little bit of background on, on the company? So yeah, so Vortex Optics, um, we're a, a sport optics company, uh, just like the name implies. Uh, uh, we've got a pretty deep lineup of optics, uh, everything from uh, holographic weapon sights and red dot sights for uh, close quarters type scenarios uh, a lot of hunting optics, uh, hunting rifle scopes, and then uh, um, optics uh, uh, geared towards that long-range precision shooting uh, tactical applications as well. So like I said, pr- pretty deep lineup. Uh, if you have an optic need, we probably have something to serve that need. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the quick and dirty, but you know, all of our optics are, are backed by our, our lifetime, no-fault, unconditional VIP warranty. So we try to build our stuff so a person never has an issue. But if they do, uh, we're going to take care of them, and and that's uh, that's truly the bottom line. I mean, that's we're we're very focused on customer service before, during, and after the sale, and and that that's another thing that's very, very, very much at our core. I've been trying very hard to break some of your stuff personally, so um, when I let when I do, I will let you know. But so far, I've been unsuccessful. Didn't you actually drop something on a? You know, on an adventure challenge you were Yeah, doing? you're talking about there was a – I have – I mean, I'm not saying it was me, but I have seen somebody like uh, <laughs> drop a, a rifle with an optic off the side of a cliff and then it still holds zero um, amazingly. So I'm not saying it was me, Mark, but yeah. if it was, um, I could send it to warranty, right? Yeah, but his absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> but his name is, you know, rhymes with Schneefi Mole. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, I mean – I'm glad. I'm glad to hear you haven't had an issue, and yeah, keep keep on using them. And yeah, if something like you said, if something happens, fire it on in. We'll take care of you. No, I've uh, you know I, I don't want to sound like too much of an infomercial, but I uh, there's I use a bunch of your products that I really like. I mean, you guys make some great stuff. So, Mark, you so what's your so at Vortex? I see you every place. I've seen you on um, you know on uh, I see you at competitions um, out there doing customer support and, and just kind of spreading the, spreading the brand and spreading the gospel. I've also seen you 
um, you know, out hunting. I've seen you on a, a few hunting shows. Um, how much time do you get to spend in the field? Uh, you know, I tell you what, as much as I can, uh, you know, I get to do a little bit of that for work and then I try and take a, a couple personal hunts every year. But so, yeah, you know, I mean, my, you know, I guess area of focus with Vortex has kind of been marketing and, me and media relations, you know, throughout my time there. So, um, and that's everything, like you said, from, you know, kind of grassroots shooting events to, uh, media planning, media buying, um, you know, uh, sponsorships and, uh, you know, working, like, working with other folks in the media, writers, things of that nature. So kind of runs the gamut a little bit, um, which is a complete blessing because I get to meet and chat with a variety of folks and, and, uh, you know, like you said, get out in the field as, as much as possible. So we've been asking a couple other folks, so we're going to ask you, you know, if you were to pick an experience, Mark, you know, kind of a form of experience or, or a hunting experience or outdoor experience or, a, you know, a shooting sports experience, fishing experience, whatever, you'd say like was one of your most impactful. I'm going to put you on the spot and say, tell us a story. Oh, man. Um, that's like trying to ask me to pick my favorite kid. Uh... You, we all have one. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> you can't tell me you look at your kids and say, you're not my favorite and you are my I mean, come on. Yeah. I, I love them both equally <laughs> in different ways. Um, you're saying you know, the right I mean, thing, but deep down we know. You know what, though? I mean, it's true. I mean, so many, you know, I guess, you know, probably my, you know, my, my passion is, is hunting and probably with, you know, um, heavily focused on big game hunting. You know, that's kind of what I grew up doing predominantly. Um, and, and so many of those memories, I mean, and you guys know, I mean, a hunt may be extremely memorable by, uh, who you spent it with. Maybe it was, you know, your family or, or, you know, and there's a lot of tradition involved or, or maybe there is particular hardship or, you know, maybe it was a, a you know, kind of a, a dream hunt once in a lifetime thing. So there's so many different components and variables that, that make up, you know, all these different experiences that, that make them awesome. Um, man, one that sticks out to me, um, this was several years ago. I went back home. Uh, you know, I moved away about 2002, I guess, from Western Washington mm -hmm. and, and went back home, connected up, connected up with my dad and my brother, uh, to, uh, chase Roosevelt elk with the rifle. And, and during, uh, it's, you know, I guess, uh, it's pretty much always pretty nasty, snarly weather. Windy. Cause it's Washington. We got a little bit of snow. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, windy, wet, miserable. And, uh, you know, we'd been biking into an area about eight miles on average, uh, each day. That's awesome. and, uh, and, uh, yeah, day five, uh, got a crack at a bull and, and, uh, it was pretty cool. I'd actually split up from my dad and my brother at that point. Uh, and, uh, had a bunch of cows and spikes come through, uh, the bottom of this clear cut that I'd hiked down into. And, uh, man, about 45 minutes later, this bull came out on the timber line and I'd been keeping a cow call in my mouth and he was sneaking up the timber line and it had to be a four point to be legal. And, uh, I just, I couldn't quite tell. I mean, those horns are so black and he was, you know, backed up to that, that, you know, that dark timber. And I ended up having to turn him out of the timber four or five times by cow calling at him. He kept trying to go in and I'd cow call and he'd come out. And finally I saw that fourth point on top and let it rip and, you know, got him and we got him, you know, fixed out mostly that night, came back the next day. It was actually uncharacteristically uh, beautiful that morning. So we dressed fairly light knowing we had to pack that bull out a considerable distance. And about the time we got to the bull, uh, the skies opened up, got super wet. Uh, we got to the bull to the landing. My brother uh, was showing signs of hypothermia. So we got him out. He was a little bit disoriented. And my dad and I ended up uh, getting that bull out. I think we left the truck at about 7 a.m. And I think we got back to the truck about 8 p.m. So it was, it was a decently long day. But that, that was a fun one just because of, you know, who it was with and being back home. And it, it, that was a fun trip. I that guess, sounds so. like a blast. I my grand, I, I always say the best times are when you almost get hypothermia. Right? Yeah, Dave, that's every year for Dave. <laughs> every year. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, my, <laughs> it was interesting, though. I'm, I'm like my brother. I'm like, dude, are you serious? I'm like, you are not making coherent thoughts. We should probably get you out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that's my my grandfather uh, ran a recreational ranch up there, uh, kind of a dude ranch up in uh, the Cleelum area um of Washington. Oh, very cool. yeah. So when I was a kid, I grew up I'm, you know, every weekend driving up from um 
Vancouver, Washington up to that, you know, to hang out with my grandparents at the, at the, their, uh, it was a big ranch with a lodge on it. And it's just an amazing, you know, just incredible. People who've never been there go. It's just an awesome place. So, Mark, we've been talking a little bit, and in and, and our podcast, we like to talk about, um, you know, the policies around land, water, uh, wildlife, and in your mind, what are the, some of the challenges that are facing us as a as an outdoor recreation community, maybe as a whole? And and if you'd like to, you know, talk about hunting and fishing, you can. But, um, but just in general, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that we face in um, in the coming years, and how do we overcome them? You know, I guess, you know, speaking, you know, maybe more specifically to hunting and fishing and shooting and, and you know, actually maybe any outdoor activity, but um, recruitment, I just see that as such a big deal. And, and if, if we don't have people to not only, I guess, you know, carry on these traditions, but unless you're enjoying, at least this is my personal belief, right? Unless you're enjoying and having experiences in these places, you're not going to care about them. And, um, totally and I think agree. that's, you know, one thing that we, we really need. We need people to care about these places. We need more people to care about these places. And, uh, you know, and, and recruitment isn't easy, you know, particularly for sp- sports that maybe um you know i guess it hasn't come sports at least on on the hunt fish side um but uh i th- and i think it just takes doing it and and i'm uh very much included in that conversation i'm definitely not telling other folks hey this is what you should be doing because i know i can be doing a heck of a lot more of it myself but i guess just being cognizant of that and if a person shows even the slightest interest you know offer to take them out and it doesn't have to be your most important hunt of the year yeah. um you know take them small yeah. game hunting take them turkey hunting you know um just just let them let them be out there with you and watch the woods wake up um i think that can open a person's eyes and they might get a a lot different perspective than than what they may have held you know even their their whole life even if they're you know in the in the later stages yeah. of life you know i i totally agree i think you know f- for all of us i think sitting around the table here, like all of us are, you know, we once were hunter mentored, we all try and get somebody out to the field. And I think you take one person out every year. Um, even if it's just to go, even if it's to go, you know, preseason, um, man, if, if each of us could just put somebody in tow every year that maybe hasn't been involved in the sport, every few years, we're going to get somebody and they're going to get involved. And if you think about the, the potential to increase the numbers of people in the sport by doing that, you know, it's big. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think if you're able to get a person to take that step, and it's it's easier, right? If if they they are they want to take that step, right? If if they if they're showing that interest, but man, if you, I, I I truly believe if you can get them to take that step, whether it's hunting, fishing, shooting, um, they'll be like, man, I get it now, I get it now. That's been my experience. Yeah, I I can't think of a person that i've taken out that doesn't want to go again doesn't want to go again and doesn't want to go with you again because yeah. i can think of a few no that, they, that they might not want to go with me they might not want to go with me again but <laughs> they certainly want to go again <laughs> i'm a bit of a game hog <laughs> Man. an admitted well, game hog <laughs> yeah Hey, we've, hey, the first step is yeah, and then there's it, no right? second step yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know, Mark, in all seriousness, man, thank you for taking a few minutes with us. And um, we're going to catch up, you know, lo- you know, again soon, I hope. And, um, man, I hope you're doing well in, in, in Wisconsin and uh, look forward to seeing you guys uh, in the next couple of weeks. Man, yeah, same with you guys. Looking forward to it. Yeah, we'll see you here shortly. And, uh, no, keep uh, keep up the good work. And you guys are doing some some awesome things and covering some great topics that are that are really, really important. And, uh you know, hopefully people got their ears on and we can all just uh, do bigger and better Mark, things. thanks for so. your time, man. All right. We're back with another great guest here. Uh, we've got uh, Landon Michaels has joined us. Landon, uh, you're with Gunworks, right? Yeah. Yeah. How's it going, guys? Hey, we're doing great on this end. Uh, how are you doing? Doing great. I understand you may be sleep deprived. Is that correct? I <laughs> uh, just had a new baby arrive just a couple days ago. So Con- yeah, just, congratulations. Uh, kind of Thank you. Yeah, Thank congratulations you. to you. That's exciting. And so we will do our best to uh, keep you out of the doghouse and, and, you know, we appreciate you taking the time to, <laughs> I, yeah, to spend I, with us, I, but oh. recognize you've got other priorities you got to deal with too. I, I do have a question. So oh, how many, how many, 
how many kids do you have to take hunting now? <laughs> uh, that's I think a you third have, boy. So, and I think you right. phrased it incorrectly. Years, it's get to now. get to. Yeah, get, get to. to take yeah, I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah, our how, oldest four, is four, so it'll be a few years yet. That's exciting. Now, be- before we get into subject matter, you know, I think that uh, what's exciting is you. I uh, was visiting with uh, Michael Labazo from your company. He was up at the uh, legislative mm. session here, working with legislators to talk about uh, a bill. Um, they actually, you guys are are encouraging your local legislators to pass a bill that changes the yeah. minimum hunting age for big game from 12 years old in Wyoming to 10 years old. That's awesome. That's that's news to me, uh, actually. But that's yeah, that that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. You know, that's not something that's really been a, a consideration for me for a while. But as a you know, the couple boys now have been thinking about that. How, well, how you many guys, years have I got to wait to till I can get them out in the field. So. Yeah, you guys aren't exactly a small company. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about Gunworks? Yeah, we've been around for oh, I think it's been ten or eleven years now since Aaron Davidson uh, founded Gunworks here in Wyoming, uh, based out of Cody, and. Uh, Kind of built a business on the science of long range. I've uh, been running a TV show. A lot of people have probably seen uh, glimpses of long range pursuit uh, for a few years now. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think we're recognized for our rifles. I think is what a lot of people think of when they uh, hear the word or the name Gunworks. Uh, we do a lot more than that. You know, we've got a range finders that we've been man- manufacturing for uh, five or six years now. But really, it, when it comes down to it, we're, we're focused on building experiences um, so we, we do a lot of training uh, we, uh, along with building the rifles building uh, optics and ballistic solutions uh, am, ammunition for the rifle so it's really a full um, kind of a full service offering uh, beginning to end in long range and it's really focused on getting people out in the field and experiencing learning and experiencing uh, shooting long range you know I had an opportunity to go up and visit one of your ranges and I think the, the thing that impressed me um, I think a lot of people, quite frankly, when you say long range, a lot of people think that long range really just means long range. And, and let me explain myself a little bit. I think what I was really impressed by was the emphasis for you guys is, is precision. It's this understanding. It's understanding yeah. what goes into it, what's going on. It's 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 making sure that whatever your one shot is, it's one shot and it's there the first time right where it's supposed to be. And I was really impressed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we hang our, our hat on that, you know, a thousand yards out of the box uh, kind of uh, slogan, but really at the end of the day, it's just about making a, a good first round impact. Right. And so, you know, if, if you're making a shot, whether it's, you know, a hundred yards or a uh, thousand yards, uh, that's really at the end of the day, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It's just about uh, improving um, our odds of success in the field and making ethical first round kills. So, uh... The outdoor, you know, we've been talking with people quite a bit um, in on this podcast. You know, everybody will listen to it and, and stitch it together about um, about opportunities in the great outdoors. About um, you know, their you know mm-hmm. what they think kind of the opportunities and the challenges are. But but the first question we've asked them is, um, you're a guy who gets out in the field a lot, right, Landon? Yeah, I try to. So you uh, live in a great part of the country, a great part of the state. To, oh yeah, to be able to get outdoors a lot. So um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I've. What's your favorite experience? If you were going to pick one, like a, a hunting experience that stands out to you, we want we want to oh, go man. for some story time. We want to we want to hear a, one of your experiences that to you, you know, just is is memorable. Gee, you know, th- th- there's a lot, and you know, I can think of, you know, my first deer or my my biggest animal or things like that. Um, you know, uh, I I had a I was really lucky to have uh, taken part in a. Um, an elk hunt here in Wyoming a few years back, uh, a good friend up here. Um, and, and I was a non-resident at the time. I grew up in Utah. I came up, have a lot of family up here and came up and hunted on a non-resident tag with a friend up here that is a resident. Um, and, uh, he ended up killing a bull that ended up, I think it's the uh, official SCI world record, uh, crossbow. Wow. Uh, scored about 426. <laughs> Just about, <laughs> no, not like you put that to memory. <laughs> just yeah, uh, give, give or yeah, give yeah. or take, right? For anybody who doesn't know, that's not and, small. And, you know, that's not you know, and and it's not the, it's not necessarily just the, the that's not a bragging point, right? Um, but the, the that bull was killed on a on a general unit in Wyoming uh, by by a guy. You know, I, I was out there. You know, he, he was helping me find a bull and I was out there trophy hunt looking for the uh-huh. biggest bull. 
well, I ended up tagging out on like a dinky little six point, you know, uh, I was happy. Great, great bull. Well, you know, he's just out there hunting, looking to fill the freezer. And, um, so I tagged out and we went out, you know, when chasing this, uh, this, uh, second bugle in the Canyon after, right after I tagged out on, on this move. And, uh, he ends up killing this just, I mean, just biggest bull I will ever see in my life. Right. And just not, not just the sheer tro uh, size of the trophy there, but, but to see, first of all, the potential that a state like Wyoming has, uh, to be able to kill a bull like that, uh, unbeknownst to anyone, right. It's, it's you know, this isn't uh -huh. out, this is DIY yeah. hunting. This is general, general tag. Uh, this is yeah, there are pictures hunt. of this thing someplace uh, beforehand and everybody's you know, chasing him. It's like, you just, this dude was hanging right. out and like for right. whoever wanted to walk in there. Right. Middle of nowhere. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's, what, this what, is the what, kind what, of what coordinate was that? Like what, where, where what drainage was that again? I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. Right. I'll, I'll send you all the GPS coordinates, but you know, the thing is, 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 you know, it, it, you'll never, you'll never find another bull in there like that, it, but it's just, there's, there's that potential for something like that to hide in there. And, and I'm, I'm so you know, sure, there's a little bit of jealousy in me <laughs> seeing a friend kill a, a bull like that. But, but to see um, just a, a guy that's just a hard, hardworking hunter, DIY, um, I, you know, so much more meaning there to me than than an army of um, of people camping on a, a giant trophy and, and selling it to the highest bidder. And and I say that not in a in a negative way because. You know, I, I support people's rights to, to do that. You know, that's a part of uh, part of hunting um, in our, our modern hunting culture. But um, just I, I love seeing uh, a trophy like that go to, to someone that's a little bit of an underdog. In, in that's the, absolutely in awesome. We we were talking to uh, we were talking to Kyle Lamb a little bit before earlier, and and it's funny you mentioned that you know that the kind of extremes, and he. You know, we were talking about what he, what the the biggest challenges are in you know in in the future of of hunting, fishing in the great outdoors. And he said to him, the biggest challenge was um, getting away from the the things that divide us all. And he calls that getting away from hyphenated hunting, to where we can all be excited about each other's opportunities yeah. and successes. And you know, wherever it's at, yeah. whatever it's at, with with whatever where with whoever you know where wherever. And I. I just think that kind of speaks to it. It's like, you Absolutely. know, I think we all get excited about those opportunities, whether it's a once in a lifetime sheep hunt that, you know, I know that you guys see a lot of those, those, uh, those folks come through gun works if they're, you know, one shot at a once in a lifetime hunt or yeah. whether it's the guy who's just getting into hunting. So he's packing a crossbow instead of a, you know, whatever other kind of tool, but right. that's, I mean, we're all in the same boat together. So, you know, what, what, when you think about the biggest challenges for the future of, you know, the culture, you know, that we all enjoy. What do you think the biggest challenges are? What do we, what do we do to overcome them? You know, I, I've, I, I'm a little bit distressed and or dismayed. Or I don't know what the word is, but, and, and I think it's a, it's a broad, broad topic and probably a, a bit of a can of worms. But, you know, I, I see, um, there, there's a few factors, but our, our current political climate, um, I see, uh, politics have being, uh, a major risk to to the hunting lifestyle in general, um, and I think there there are there are winds blowing that um, are very dangerous to the future of our hunting lifestyle. And I think I speak in very broad terms, but um, you know, so so I think there's things there, you know, with 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 uh, Second Amendment and gun gun rights and all of that, but also um, you know, you see some of the, the things happening, uh, recently with, you know, uh, the grizzly hunt, hunting bands and, and British Columbia and things like that. And, and, and New Jersey black bear is another example. We're going to be fighting more and more of that. Yeah. Right. I mean, th th that, there is a wave coming and I, I, I frankly, I, I'm, I probably sound pretty, um, you know what? I, my I, 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 I love your input. I love the question, you know, and, and the thought, I think in the last, you know, in the last few months, I've thought the same thing that, that hunters and outdoors, like I'm just going to call us outdoors people, 
to avoid saying like outdoors been outdoors and what we need to we have to really be cautious because yeah unfortunately i agree i think it's very easy for people who would like political gain to try and carve up our community um in in hopes of yeah. um in in hopes of changing the calculus you know of a vote well, and can i be more blunt yeah. about it i mean uh, you know, i mean we, we, so we, i kind of view yeah. it like this you know, th think of the, the hunting world as we know it as the onion. This is all peel the layers of the onion back and you get to the very center of it and there's no hunting. And, and what you have right now, and very specifically what you have, you have, you know, we're pe we have groups that are trying to peel away pieces, little yeah. pieces at a time. So it's in, in one place, it's you yes. know, banning yeah, grizzly absolutely. bear hunting in British Columbia or black bear hunting in New Jersey or mountain lion hunting in California. And then it moves to the next step. Then we're talking about, well, we should stop allowing baiting of bears or we should stop allowing trapping uh of, of predators or or fur bearers and then it's you peel that layer off and then we're talking about the type of ammunition that you can use and then we're talking you know yeah. the type the pipe type of firearm you can use and ultimately the end game is to peel every layer of that onion back until there's nothing left yeah right well you know yeah yeah you know i i, I see the you know the, the fight on assault weapons you know and it's like well you no, know, they they have you know that the claim at least is that they have no use in, in hunting. Well, now I start seeing um, you, you know a, a few kind of hints here and there of oh well, all these guys are shooting these long range sniper rifles, so that's scary too. Well, you know that's the that's that's the one one weapon, the one firearm that was holy and safe is is a simple bolt action <laughs> hunting rifle. Well, you know even that apparently is not safe. You know I I just I see no end to it and. I think it's dangerous. And, you know, so I guess um, there's that. And then I see on the, the opposite side is uh, that we are not doing ourselves any favors here as well. And I think the, the infighting that happens uh, in within the hunting and, sh and fire firearms community um, is is doing it. We're basically agreed. Uh, you know, we need to take a step. You know, so how do we do that? Not, not fight amongst ourselves. And so. You know, I see all this. Oh, man. Yeah, if 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 maybe there were maybe answer, maybe you're, that maybe now, right? we're just charting the path forward. Maybe but, there is an easy, maybe there's an easy answer, but getting to the answer is hard. You know, I think yeah. I, I love. I talk, I've talked to some people about this, and I'm just going to throw it out there because this is my trademark term. We have to get past partisan. Like, what is a partisan? It's somebody that goes to a, a corner, goes to a certain yeah yeah identity, yeah. and then fights for that identity and is, 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 is going to battle for that identity. We have to get past partisan. We have to be able to realize that these things, you know, this, this opportunity, this culture we want to keep, it's bigger than any one of any, any single one of us. It's bigger than, you know, the, than, than my personal preference of what I like to hunt with. It's bigger than the personal, you know, than the game I want to hunt. You know, it's, it, you know, and if we and if we don't stand together, you know, is is it isn't it Benjamin Franklin? If we don't hang together, we shall all hang separately. Is it? That's profound. So so yes, something. something <laughs> Landon, how, what do you think? How do we? You, do you have any thoughts on how we overcome these challenges? You know, it, it's I I think I, I I don't know exactly what it stems from, but I, I think there's there's just some childish. Um, there's there's egos right i mean it, it, hunting by i think kind of by nature is is ego driven right and and i don't say that negatively either but you know we're we're you know from back in caveman times you know i mean being able to to uh, uh feed your feed your family yeah. meant hanging something on the wall or hanging something on the wall meant that you could feed your family right and so i think um uh hunting is is kind of a way to to feed our egos uh just like playing playing football or or anything else um playing games it's you know so so there's there's a little bit of that i think that kind of manly um chest thumping um uh going on that it it's tough to i think get away from this uh you know to this kind of yeah. fighting, you know, mine's bigger than yours, right? I like mine's that perspective. I think it's a, but I, I think I, that's I a really, how, but, really you know, we just strong perspective. And I, and I think you're right. And I, I yeah. think a lot of times we think of that as people, um, you know, we think of, 
of that as people looking, you know, people looking down at each other as if it's the, the, the guy who, you know, people are looking down at each other. That's what, that's what it is. Yeah. They're just looking down at each other from different Hills, from different kinds of Hills. And maybe somebody's looking up the Hill at that guy, but it's, it is a, it is a judgment issue. It's, yeah. it's a pride issue. It's a, you know, a jealousy issue, even though you might not consider it that, you know, but it's, it is saying like, yeah, my way is better than that guy's way. And it's something that, you know, I think if we're conscious of it, we can overcome it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I hate to get too partisan and, you know, I don't know if you guys, uh, we do. Uh, Dave's terrible about bit, not, uh, not left or not right, <laughs> right leaning, but you know, in, in my mind, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to voice my opinion, but I don't want to drive too much for you guys. But, you know, in, in my mind that, you know, be, personally being a, con, a conservative is it's like the the approach to capitalism is, you know, small government, not telling people the way they should live their lives. And I see so much of these guys that are like, well, you know, you should have been able to get closer to that animal or why do you need a rifle to do it? You could do it with a bow or whatever else. It's like we're literally going against conservative values to say i'm going to determine how you should do what you do and live your life in this way right you know i i think we need a little bit of a conservative approach to hunting which is is hands off uh and let people live their lives the way that, you know they want to live when it comes to hunting you know you kill you want to kill yeah. with a bow kill with a bow you want to kill it from a thousand yards do it ethically but you know, do it how you, how you do it. And, and I think the other thing is, is uh, ethics by their very nature are personal. And I think every person needs to determine their own ethics. And once we start going down that road of telling people that I'm going to determine what's ethical in hunting. I think we're going to leave you, it with that. Then we're I think, you know, we agree. Yeah, no, can't, 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 can't add on to that. No. <laughs> well, Landon, thank you once again for your time. Sincerely appreciate it. I hope you get some sleep tonight. My guess is you haven't had much lately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we appreciate the partnership. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> we'll try. Oh, no. Running on fumes a little bit. But, All right. Uh, Landon, doing good. we'll talk to you later. You guys give me the opportunity to hop on tonight. All right. Thanks again to Ryan Bronson from Federal Premium Ammunition, to Kyle Lamb from Viking Tactics, to Mark Boardman from Vortex Optics, and to Landon Michaels of Gunworks for spending the time with us today and introducing us to your, uh, your great companies and your conservation mission. If you liked what you heard, and we hope you did, please go out to wherever you get this podcast and subscribe. Give us a rating Leave us a comment and then go a nice, find a us nice one. a nice comment. Yeah. yeah. And then go find us uh, on the interwebs, right? Go find us on your social media platform, whether it's, we Instagram, don't know how it works, but you do, you do, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at the handle at it's your mountain, find us there. And remember life is about experiences. So go have one.